So my name is Belinda Croson. I'm speaking today as the president of the Lethbridge Historical Society. So that's the hat I'm wearing. Um, I think many of you know I have many hats, but I'm very much historical society today. And not only will I be speaking about our most current publication, but I'll be talking about our publication program and why the Lethbridge Historical Society has been publishing books. So the Lethbridge Historical Society has been publishing books since the 1960s. So we are actually one of the oldest publishing enterprises in Alberta and we actually have our the latest book is number 62 so some of those have been reprints but if you want to have every one we've ever published you will need to have 62 of our books on your shelf and when you go when we look at some of the books we have published over the years you'll be, not be surprised by many of them and we publish for a large variety of reasons we publish so the stories won't be lost. These are things that we want people to know. But we also publish to educate and to entertain. We publish to encourage people to learn about local history. And as you'll see as we go along, we also publish for the sales, not surprisingly, because we use the money from our publications to run our society and also to get history projects done. There is a concept many of you may have heard about, this thing wants to now just fall down, called social enterprise. It's where not-for-profits actually are involved with business-like enterprises. And the Historical Society has been doing this for over 60 years without even realizing it was social enterprise. So we actually use our publications as a way to make sure that history gets done. And so our book publishing is a huge part of that. We also sometimes publish things that we know are not going to be big sellers just because we know the story is vital that if we won't do it, no one else will. So when you look at what is published through commercial publishing companies, we quite often will do subjects and do issues that no one else does. The other thing that stands out about our books, and we always call them books, they are technically occasional papers, which is why we still publish in that eight and a half by 11 inch format, because they are technically papers, not books. Um, that's how they're seen in the publishing world. And ours just look different on the shelf than everybody else's, so we're going to stick with the way we've been publishing. Our books are almost entirely written by members, and every one of our members who has written one of our books has donated the manuscript to our society. So our authors make absolutely no money through writing our books, and no one else involved does either. Our editors don't, our publishing um, salespeople don't, no one makes money. We do this solely to support local history, and to support the society. And so it's not as if an I or anyone else are making you know, money and becoming wealthy off of this. And when you think of the writers of our historical books, they're going to be some of the names that you know, and these probably are books some of you have on your shelves. So see how many of our authors and how many of our books you recognize. So you couldn't start talking about publishing with LHS without starting with Alex Johnston. Um, he was longtime uh, president of our society, and through both his work at the research center and his work at the LHS, he was behind many of our publications. These are, these are two that you are still in print: Plants in the Blackfoot and the Canadian Pacific Railway High Level Bridge. The CPR High Level Bridge has been in several reprints. It's been updated several times. And we have sold about 7,000 copies of that over the decades that it's been in print, which wouldn't just make it a historical society bestseller. It actually puts it on like a bestseller almost in Canada when you think of 7,000 books of a local history book. But other publications that Alex Johnston did over the years, Boats and Barges on the Belly River. He co-wrote Lethbridge Place Names and Points points of interest with Barry Pete. He wrote a publication on the Chinook Club, on the Gulf Gardens Park, on Lethbridge's medical doctors, dentists, drug stores, and on many more. And so it's with Alex Johnston that our publishing interest actually starts, um, and we would not be where we are without his work. Another one of our authors that you may remember was Dr. Johan Dormar. 
who wrote Sweetgrass Hills, wrote Oil City on the Black Gold in Waterton Park with Robert Watt, Milk River, Alberta's 49th Parallel. Now, when you look at these books, you might go, you're the Lethbridge Historical Society. None of these are set in Lethbridge. Our name is a bit... Um, misdirecting because we are actually the Southern Alberta chapter of the historical side of Alberta. So our mandate is actually Saskatchewan to BC, Nanton to Montana. And so we have members from right across that entire area and we work on issues across that entire area. Our focus tends to be more on Lethbridge, but we do work across that area. And as a member of the Historical Society of Alberta, we're part of a society that has been in existence since 1907. We were actually created by the Alberta legislature in 1907. And it's always interesting because there'll be new um, societies that pop up and we'll be working on things in their area. And they're going, you're stepping into our area. And we're like, we've been doing this area since 1907. I think you may be stepping into our area without realizing it. Um, and we do collaborate with a lot of the other historical societies, but we do have very much a regional aspect as much as we are an urban aspect. Some of our other publications, Lethbridge, Legacy of Lethbridge Women, Butcher Baker, Candy Maker, uh, many of these were involved with Irma Dogtrum. One of her more famous books, which we didn't put in here, is Where Was It? Um, and Irma wrote several of our books, um, often with an interest to the questions she was getting from researchers and trying to answer them. Legacy of Lethbridge Women, which is out of print right now, um, are all about the women who um, are named, have streets named after them in Legacy Ridge. And when they first started that subdivision, everybody who bought a new house got one of these books um, to tell why their streets were named that way. The other th this is like the new technology in City Hall. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, that was off. Um, <laughs> but um, when you go through Legacy Ridge, there's a reason those road names are so long, because if we'd just given the last names, everybody would assume it was named after men. And so we had to put the, or they had chose to put the entire names of the women, so you know those were named after women, who are all listed in this book. And then, of course, we have some of the Gary Ellison books, uh, Sporting Legends of the South, Prairie Boys, My Side of Town. Uh, Gary wrote several of our books, um, and he wrote a lot of ones that were all, like people's memories of places. Um, 13th Street, My Side of Town, still remains one of our best sellers. Um, there's nothing like a north sider to want just to continue the north side history and so that one generations of people on the north side still are purchasing that book as well as others as well and some of our others five celebrated early surgeons written by a doctor and historian from actually central alberta sterndale bennett railways in southern alberta written by somebody who has an order of the british empire that was actually written by um, rfp bowman um, and if you ever want to know his world war ii story it's fascinating outside of his work with the society Battalion of our own on the 113th overseas, the Highlanders, answering children's cries on um, the orphanage that existed in Lethbridge, but also in, in uh, work done around children's issues in the early part of Lethbridge, the Lethbridge Viaduct, on and on. Um, and then these are my publications that I have put out with the society. Um, I tend to do social history. I tend to like to do the stories that people tell me should never be talked about. <laughs> um, so, of course, I have taken on Red Light District, I've taken on Prohibition, I've taken on Strange Stories. I always love the digging into those sort of things. So, all of these books, um, these are some of the books that are still in print, but of all the books the Historical Society has done, many are no longer in print. So, we have worked with the University of Lethbridge. If you go on the library page, Many of our books that are no longer in print have been digitized, and you can actually still access them as researchers. So if you're looking for our older publications, they are still there as well. And both the public library and the university library have really good sets of our older books if you're looking for those. So long history, almost any topic you can imagine, but we're, of course, not done. We have more books we want to do. Now, when you think about our books, as I went through that list, I focused on the authors. And so often, it is our authors who become better known than anybody else. And that's almost not fair, because 
if any of you have ever published a book, the amount of work that goes into it, the author is part of it, but there are so many more people involved in publishing a book than just the author. Um, and there's so much more that goes on because we do everything, as I said, as a volunteer organization. Everything is done by people donating their own time, right from setting up our books to editing our books, etc. So I want to tell you about a little bit about the people behind the scenes. If any of you know Carly Stewart, he was behind the scenes for decades. Um, up until the last about six of our publications, none of them would have been done without Carly's work, making sure they got edited, making sure they got through the publishing process. Carly is just one of them though. Over the 60 years, there's been a lot of people involved. And it'd be impossible to tell you everyone who worked behind the scenes. So I'm gonna tell you about a few people who just worked on this latest publication. One of them is Carol McGaw. Carol is our past president of the Lethbridge Historical Society, and for the last while, she has been the chair of our publications committee, which means she takes a book from the initial idea discovering if it's a topic that you know is worth being put into a book, et cetera, right through the publication process, which means everything from finding editors, uh, making sure that people who are working on the book are getting things done, but also because we are a society, none of our work can get done unless our members vote on it. So it means actually taking motions to our members so that we actually have permission to spend the money. It means getting ISBNs from um, Library and Archives Canada. The other thing, if, if you publish the first two copies that come off the print, you have to send to Library and Archives Canada. Uh, they get the first two copies of every book in Canada, and if you don't, they will track you down and harass you until you send them. Uh, right? So it's all that behind the scenes stuff that Carol is responsible for, and she used to be an assessor, a tax assessor. She is really good at details. Um, absolutely a vital part of getting a book published. Um, she and I are quite interesting. I'm an idea person, she's a detail person, so together we really do well on publishing. Uh, we hold each other to account, um, but we could not do our publishing right now without Carol and all the other past chairs of our publications committee. The other thing is when you look at one of our books, somebody has to take the raw idea of an author and actually put it on paper and put in the photographs and design the books and make them all do that. And all that work is done by Bobby Fox. She is our secretary, so she has a job on the executive. But throughout that work as well, she actually designs all of her books in InDesign, sets them out and does all that work, which is hours and hours. Because almost any of those publishing things, as soon as you make a change, everything seems to reformat itself. Um, and she spends hours fighting with programs. The other thing, because she's our secretary, we actually sell a lot of our books online. So Bobby takes all of the online orders and makes sure that they get sent on to the person who will get them mailed out. So she spends a lot of time answering emails, um, especially when a new book comes out. And these are some of our other members who do editing. Um, I don't know about you, but as an author, I hate my editors. Right? As an author, everything's perfect until the editors look at it and remind you of all the mistakes. Um, but you absolutely need the people who will tell you every comma you've made a mistake on and check your punctuation and your spelling and question if your history facts are accurate. And uh, on our last publication, Christy, Nicole, and Lorian were the editors who went through. Um, we're also using more AI stuff, as other people are as well. AI is actually quite effective for giving you a sense of it. Um, but we like the human perspective to make sure it still has a true voice of it. Um, and these three took a lot of time to go through and I have to say, made, I found a lot of my mistakes. <laughs> Um, any mistakes that still exist are my own, but they found a lot of ones that got corrected before it went to print. And again, all done by volunteers, all done by members of our society. Getting a book done, though, is half the thing. It's amazing how many books get completed and never go anywhere else. So we have a book sales team. Uh, this is Robert Oakley. He is um, one of the part of the group that makes sure our books get sold. 
And if you were at the post offices in Lethbridge in December, you would have met Robert <laughs> because he probably was mailing out a book almost every night in December as our book orders for the new book and others were coming through. Because uh, when we bring out a new book, it actually pushes up the book sales of all of our books. So we were, you know, sell it. we sold hundreds of books in um, December, many of them locally through the bookstores here, but also online. And we have sold books from coast to coast. That's the beauty of online bookstores. Um, we, we have books all across. I think the greatest thrill I ever had was when, when the wives, a wife of one of the past governor generals, asked for one of her books. So I knew it was actually sitting in Rideau Hall for a while. Um, not there now, but that was probably one of the greatest things is when we had requests from the governor general's wife for one of our books. So we know our books are all over. You can even occasionally find them in like Toronto Public Library and things like that. So let's look now at the present book. As I said, we've been publishing for dinner for decades. And so our present book is both a new publication and a reprint. Uh, when we talked to Library and Archives Canada, they said there was enough changes that we had to do it as a separate publication. So that's why it's a different publication than this one, but it's based on this. And this was done in 1980 by Warren Hall and Barb Goodman. And they took the idea of a then and now book. They took pictures from early 1900 and around 1975, and they showed the two. And so we decided to take the early 1900, around 1975, and then more present day photographs, and to update the book. Um, and so we took their idea and went from there. And just, we didn't use the same cover, but that picture is 100 years old, the picture online. It was about 1924, so that's about a 100-year-old photograph of 4th Avenue South. Um, dating photographs is always fun. Now, in order to update it, we had to find the early photographs, but we also had to get new photographs. And if you look at all the photographs, the new photographs, they were taken by two people, Mike Jensen, who does a lot of the Historical Society's photography, and myself. And it's not easy to replicate a photograph because there might now be a building in the way or trees in the way or like it's changed enough that sometimes you can't get in the right spot. But we sent Mike all over Lethbridge. We sent him everywhere saying, you go stand on that coulee and get this picture and go there and get this picture. And he, he did. He, uh, and so you'll see much of his work in there. Um, one of the things that we do beyond this book is we try to not only tell you the story of the past, but we try to think of what future historians will want. So um, we have a lot of members of the society, Mike probably does more than anybody, but who are documenting things today, going to events, to, um, picturing you know, construction work and new buildings and things like that, so that we're trying to capture what we think historians of the future will want. And we know 99% of the time we'll probably be wrong because quite often it's the event that you don't think is important. Um, so, but we just try to document everything. And so thank heavens for really good stories storage of devices that we can put all the photographs on. Um, but we have photographs of everything. Some of you may actually be in many of our photographs. You just never know when we're going to show up photographing at events. So um, we're those annoying people at family reunions, but we're annoying at everything. And so all of this went into the publication. Um, as I said, the design work inside was done by Bobby. The covers quite often we go for a professional. So Anine Vonkman actually designed it, the cover. Um, anybody recognize where the cover is? That's the pavilion at Henderson Lake. And since it's reflected in the lake, we thought it was a good cover for upon further reflection. So that is the old pavilion that has been gone several decades. Um, and that is Henderson Lake from decades past on the cover. Um, it's always interesting for a cover. Um, you want to put the picture of the titles near the top. So if it goes on a rack, you can still read the title. And you're trying to choose the colors and everything. And Anine is really good for helping us design those. So um, we did pay to get the cover designed, everything else was internally done. And then we had to make some decisions. 
did we only use the sites in the old book or knowing what we know now, did we add sites? And we made the hard decision to only do the sites in there. And I have already had about 10 people, and I'm sure I'll get more going, my building isn't in there. Or you missed this site, or you know, I'm like, you know, we're not done publishing. Like, you could show up in another book at some point. But because we were trying to stay true to them, we tried very much to stick with what they did. And I tried to match my writing voice to their voice, which is much harder than it sounds. I have a new um, appreciation for ghost writers who try to write in somebody else's voice. So I tried to stay true to theirs. So we had to decide whether or not to use EndNotes on this. We chose not to for a couple of reasons. One, uh, when we did the picture book with another publisher, uh, we found out that often with picture books they don't. It's just one of the things that picture books are different than reference books. And because this one didn't have them and we're not seeing this as a reference book, we chose not to. Um, if you're ever wondering about the dates and everything in there, I have about 70 files if you want to check if I have the right dates in the updated stuff. Um, but most of our books, most of my publications will find EndNotes. This one doesn't. So this is not meant to be a reference book. This is meant to be a coffee table, enjoy the pictures book. So it has a, has a different function to it. But it is one of the frustrating parts of some of our older publications because when you're trying to check on how accurate the material is, there aren't any end notes, footnotes, etc. cetera. Uh, we're trying to make them much more of uh, reference books. So some decisions that we had to make, every book make those sort of decisions. But now into the book. So some of the sites we picked have changed very rare, uh, very little. And so this, of course, is the northwest corner of 4th Avenue and 5th Street. Um, you can see the original buildings are still there. The Hotel Alexandra, or uh, Pat Burns Block, or the Alec Arms Hotel, except for the color, really hasn't changed much. It's still the same shape. The building beside it, um, the old Alexandra Cafe, which is now a Lucky Lady Lounge, um, is still the same building from 1908. So that play, picture with the beautiful archway is still behind there, behind the ugly facade of today. Um, it's one of those buildings I'd love to rescue and just go at night and try to take that facade off. I won't. Um, I do like guerrilla history, but that is certainly one of the buildings. The fun thing about this picture, not in the book, but the Alec Arms is one year newer than the theater beside it. And when they built the hotel, um, vibrations from building the hotel actually took down one of the walls of the theater. Luckily, nobody was seriously hurt. It was middle of the afternoon. No shows were going on. Um, but it did mean a change. Um, no longer after this building collapsed was the fire chief, the building inspector for Lethbridge. They actually hired a building inspector. So it actually led to major changes in the city. So I always laugh when I look at this picture because it has much more history to it than just the photograph. Another site that has changed a lot is this site. This is the corner of 1st Avenue and 9th Street, or 1st Avenue and Stafford Drive. Um, on your left is the original federal building, which was also the courthouse. And why there's so many people outside that building is they are lined up for homesteads. Um, that is where one of the buildings that you would have gone to if you wanted a homestead in the early 1900s. And they literally lined up for days outside these buildings. We know one person in a January lineup died of pneumonia. Um, and the city got involved and they actually started to rent out space on the sidewalk. Um, and so you could rent a space. And we have photographs around this building of police officers maintaining because they also got into fights about, you know, getting a better place in line. That building was later taken over as our first legion, and that's the center building when it was the legion and it was expanded. Um, we've since, of course, this building was knocked down shortly after the legion on Mayor McGrath Drive was constructed, and now the hotel sits on that site. And so that's how that site has changed over the years. Um, and Galt Gardens is another one where, of course, the, you know, has changed dramatically. So in the first picture, you're looking across at some of the early trees in Galt Gardens. You're looking across before much was constructed there. Um, and then you see the 1940s. Does anybody know what that brick building was? It used to have an attendant. It's the comfort station. It's the bathrooms in Galt Gardens. And they used to actually have a paid attendant 
who would be there to make sure it was cleaned and was always in the comfort station if you needed anything. And then, of course, the entrance to Galt Gardens today. Um, so that place has changed a lot. The beautiful thing about Galt Gardens has always been a park uh, since 1885. Um, Elliot Galt, again, this isn't in the book, but my head keeps going other places, which is why I have to write more books. Um, Elliot Galt did not trust the city not to keep that as a park. So he actually got the Alberta legislature to pass an act, which is still in existence, that this would always remain a park. So if you don't trust the city, you've got to get the province to do it or vice versa. Another place which has changed dramatically over the years is the River Valley. Uh, with the development of the park system in the 1980s, um, moving people out in the 1960s, et cetera. Um, but it's always hard to get really good pictures. Um, we see the Coolies and the River Valley today as this amazing spot of our park system, and we love the Coolies. But at one time, the Coolies were actually considered wasteland. When you think how many of our dumps, our nuisance grounds were in the Coolies and how many things we're still digging up, to them it was not a place of beauty to be photographed, so it's actually hard to find a lot of good historic pictures of the Coolies. Um, and so uh, this is, both of these pictures are more modern, 1960s and present pictures of the Coolies, but uh, there are some older pictures as well in the book. I've just got a few minutes left. So again, why publish the books? Well, it is to preserve and share the stories of Lethbridge and Southern Alberta, but it's also the money. We actually, because we are the Southern Alberta chapter of the Historical Site of Alberta, we make donations to other organizations. So we do sometimes get organizations that come to us and ask for money, and um, we will, again, case-by-case -case basis, um, working with our membership, we donate. Um, it was one of my great joys. I got to sign checks for $2,000 in December. One of the biggest ones we give away is actually, we give it back to the Historical Site of Alberta because we have a grants program. Only members of the HSA and LHS can apply for it, but it actually supports uh, projects right across Alberta. Last year, one of the researchers at the University of Lethbridge got one of these grants. Uh, the Kootenai Brown Pioneer Village got a grant to work on one of their new um, comic books that they have been putting out for the last while and then others across the province. So we're trying to encourage always people to research into history, write history, and that grants program. And then it supports the LHS. Uh, last, last month, I've actually done two um, casinos in Alberta, or here in Lethbridge, for other organizations, not the LHS. But talking to the people about how hard it is to get volunteers, et cetera, I am so happy the LHS, because of our book publishing, has never had to do a casino. And we're not constantly begging for money because of you know, book publishing. So every time you purchase one of our books, you are actually supporting and helping us maintain the history of the area because it keeps things going. And so some of the things we've spent money on, the plaque program around the city, we work in partnership with the city of Lethbridge, but one of our volunteers has this bad joke that we see more plaque than dentists. Um, because almost every plaque you see up in the city of Lethbridge, we probably have been involved with in some way, especially the historic plaques. But we actually have plaques from the Livingston Gap to Bow Island. The Historical Society has plaques right across the area, so we actually document through plaques all sorts of things. Sometimes we work with others to help pay for them, sometimes we pay for them ourselves. This is our new interpretive sign on um, 2nd Avenue South um, that tells the history of that area. So we are always constantly working on things like that, which is what our money helps to go into. Um, oh, I thought I had done more pictures, but one of my slides seems to have disappeared. You can purchase our books here in Lethbridge. Analog sells them, Club Cigar sells them, Galt Museum and Archives, Stubbs Pharmacy, University of Lethbridge. Outside of Lethbridge, Kootenai Brown sells our books. Writing on Stone uh, sells them when they're open during the summer. They're all over. And like I said, there's our online bookstore. When you are publishing or purchasing our books, uh, know that there are two prices for almost every one of our books. There's the price that you and the public pay, and then there's often a price for our members. So membership literally does have its privileges. They often get a better price. They also get invited to tours that you never get to hear about, um, all sorts of things. So what I'm saying is, why aren't you all members? 
it's probably one of the smartest things you can do from my perspective. Um, and so we have um, wonderful organizations that help us to sell our books. We sell them ourselves as well. And then right now is really strange. We don't have another book in the queue right now. We're, we have nothing that we're actually working on. After having put out a, quite a few books in the last few years, it isn't that, well, not bad to have a bit of a break, but it's always the question, what shall we publish next? So if you have ideas, you can always share, but I'll be honest, if you're not a member, your opinion doesn't matter as much. <laughs> like, we want you to buy it, but our members are the ones that will actually vote on what we publish. So they're the ones that will have the final say on what comes up. So I want your ideas because I'll steal them, but the final say will be the membership on what we publish next. Of course, as I said, membership has its privileges. So thank you all for letting me speak to you today. Belinda. So uh, I'll be very quick here because we are a little bit, because of our technical difficulties, we're running a little late. So um, I just want to mention that Terry, I think, is still taking memberships. Terry Shillington, if anyone wants to buy a membership. Uh, we want to thank LSCO for letting us use this room and the University of Lethbridge for their support, Rogers TV for recording our sessions, and the Herald for their coverage and support. Uh, next week, the speaker will be Julia Brasolato on how are the medically assistance dying experiences different in the context of rural living. Oh, and the jars. <laughs> Bev's holding up the jars. Please donate into the jars if you're able. That would be appreciated. Um, okay. Oh, okay, right. first questions. Line up along the side here, and if you could, please, after you ask your question, go and sit down. Then the speaker won't be looking at you in responding. And uh, also, when we're when we're asking questions, please try to look at the camera. Makes for better TV. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lori Schultz. Belinda, thank you so much for your presentation today. I've got a couple of questions. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, donating to other groups, uh, the U of L. I'm just curious if uh, the Lethbridge Horse Historical Society um, collaborates with high schools or with the university um, history classes. Uh, any collaboration between those students and LHMS? Um, and also, the second question, um, any, is, is there any advocacy to restore uh, old buildings or, um, you know, guidance around heritage sites, that sort of thing? Thanks. One of the things we chose to do a few years ago, the Historic Society of Alberta, is that post-secondary students can join the Historic Society of Alberta, which means all of its chapters, so they'll be assigned to the chapter in their area, absolutely for free. So we are trying to reach out because we do need to get young historians involved um, because, you know, as active as we are, we're not going to live forever and we need to replace ourselves. So we are working with them. We also partner, the Lethbridge Historical Society partners every year with the University of Lethbridge in the Alex Johnston Lecture. Uh, which we had last November, so we do have that partnership. And we work quite closely with very, like, there are members of the university who are active in the society, and in fact, we have a young university student who just joined our board when our board had its AGM in November. So we do work with them quite often. We don't do as much with, you know, high school as we should. It's actually one of those things on our stuff. But as a volunteer board, um, we, we can't do everything we would like to, so we certainly work in that area. Uh, when it comes to historic buildings, thanks to the amazing work of Jean Johnston, who you know, pushed historic buildings as uh, something we should care about, the um, LHS has been active in historic buildings for quite a while now. Um, through the bylaw of the City of Lethbridge, uh, the Historic Places Advisory Committee, there must be an LHS rep on there. So we are actively involved in that. And it's one of the reasons that we actually um, worked with the city to start the plaque program. So many building owners do not know the value of their buildings. In fact, they might not know the history, they might not know the story, especially when we help to start the plaque program. And so the plaque program is kind of our entryway into it, going, did you know you have an awesome building? So, so amazing that we're going to pay to put a plaque up if you'll let us. Um, and that's the way to start the conversation about 
Have you considered designation? Have you looked more into it? Uh, and I'm just going to make this pitch for designation. Uh, the province has taken designation and passed it on to the municipalities in many ways. And so Lethbridge we designate a lot, so is Edmonton, so has Calgary. But the pot of money that a designated building can go to for a grant has never increased which means that the amount of money they can get in a grant, even though it's still set at 100000 max and 50000 for municipal, gets smaller every year because more are applying for it. Um, so it would be really amazing if the province would increase the amount of money in the pot because um, those are matching grants that the owners of buildings are eligible for, so that would really help. So um, if I have this opportunity, I'm going to plug that because we could certainly use more money. So we're constantly working on that. We will... Um, we often will do research on buildings, we'll help people out with their buildings. The other thing is you probably see we, uh, we have photographed every one of the houses in Lethbridge that's older than 1950. And if you follow us on Facebook every eight days, and eight is just random, we put up a history of a house in Lethbridge. Um, only if you're a member can you ask for your house to be de um, researched. Otherwise, it's just whenever I feel like it, your house might pop up and you'll never know. It's what I, what I get interested in. But we, from um, historic houses to historic buildings, it is one of the things we work on among all the other aspects of history. Two mics. Hi, Leona Jacobs. So in your comment in response to Lori about connecting with younger generations, I recently had the opportunity to read a memoir that was done in a graphic format. Have you considered putting some of your books into more of a graphic um, or maybe re even reissuing some of your older books as graphic novels, in quotation marks, because they're not novels, obviously, but that, that kind of gets the message across in a different way. Now we have that to contend with. Um, we, ha we are not looking at that specifically, but our Central Alberta chapter is taking some Carrie Woods books and are doing precisely that. So we'll be watching what the Red Deer Central Alberta chapter does, because yes, if it works out, we might steal that idea from them, um, and because we'll see how effective it is. And that's the beauty of having chapters across the province. We all inspire and take ideas. Uh, we are looking at other ways, though. Uh, we've been talking about you know videos and podcasts and other things that will take take some of our ideas and put them in a new package because we, we have all these stories there, um, but sometimes it's difficult. So the one thing we're working on right now is we have collected as much as we could find of like fun and weird facts about Lethbridge, and now we want to figure out how to put it, like putting it up on our website, that seems kind of boring. So we're trying to figure out how to do that um, because, and again, just one little thing. We had a Nobel Prize winner born in Lethbridge. No Nobel Prize winner has ever been born in Calgary or Edmonton that I'm aware of. So yeah, we're ahead of them on that one. He only did live here like eight hours, but still. Like, yeah, it still counts. So my name is Mark Gettle. I'm just wondering, is, uh, the, the uh, plaques are wonderful, but I'm just wondering, do you have a problem with vandalism, as you see that in many provincial parks, whatever, you have plaques and information and vandalism. And the other question would be, has there any been uh, consideration of maybe using QR codes at the plaques so that someone would just scan with the, uh, with the phone, as in many cities, and then it, it'll bring you to a website where you have a lot more information about that? Thing. I know it'd be a huge project, but it'd be very useful, I think. Um, so far, we have not seen any theft or vandalism on our plaques, so please keep our plaque program under your hat. I mean, it's always, we're, we're worried about it because we've seen it happening everywhere in cemeteries, in all kinds of places. So far, we haven't seen it, but yeah. Um, and it's again, I just had somebody in our society send a picture of a plaque that needs polishing. Like, we watch our plaques, even though there's a lot of them, but we try to keep track of that. Uh, we don't have QR codes on our plaques, but we just put up the downtown back alleys. They've all been named um, in the downtown and if you, when it's warm go have a look because there's all kinds of people um, there's QR codes on those and to just give you a sense in the back alley project it started as a joke um, I did it, it started about 10 years ago if the rich people originally got the streets named after them the poor working people like me were going to get the back alleys 
So I named the back alleys, just chose myself, named every back alley after a random person, like including the first person to ever be in the provincial jail in Lethbridge, um, to the first health inspector. So if, you, if I thought you might use a back alley, you got a back alley named after you. Not everybody, of course. And there's QR codes on those. And so we're looking more for that to try to layer it so there's more ways of finding the information. But you're right, it's a lot of work because it's not only maintaining the sign, it's maintaining the, the site. Um, and right now, our, again, our website is maintained by a volunteer. Um, and sometimes new website stuff is beyond volunteers. So it may not be the most perfect site. Um, it's something that needs work on, like everything we do. Um, but that's the difficulty is some of the stuff you almost need a master's degree in IT to do some of the ideas we have. So again, buy a membership and volunteer. Hey, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, I enjoy history, so here learning something about Lethbridge is great. Uh, I'm Mary Shillington, and um, uh, my, my question which has, seems to have disappeared. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, I know. Um, it, it, I know some people who, whose homes have been designated as historic sites. And that gets complicated when people want to do renos or changes of some kind. So what's, what's your experience with that and what would you advise people uh, if that would, you know, if people have heard that information, they might hesitate to want, not want their house to designated historically. So what's your experience with that? So yes, that is one of the things that people have a lot of concerns about is you're going to tell me what to do. When a building is designated, it's not the entire building that's designated. What is often designated are what's called character defining elements. And those can be interior or exterior. They tend to be exterior, but we can do interior parts. And a conversation is had between the owner and whomever's designating, whether it's the municipality or whether it's the province. And you talk about what needs to be kept. So across the street, we have a designated building. The sign is part of the, you know, of the reason that building was designated, so that can't be taken down. So there's certain things. And that's why the owner has to be very aware of what is of value and the conversation has to be had because these buildings will only last and only matter if they're still used, if they're still lived in, if they're still maintained. And so that conversation is vital about what is so important and what will be changed. If a character defining element needs to be changed, you can get permission to change it, but that does mean conversation here in Lethbridge with the Historic Places Advisor Committee, if it's a provincial one with the provincial body and the province is involved in both situations and they'll have a conversation. Um, for example, we had a house that was designated that they needed to put an elevator on the outside. It was allowed to happen, but again, it's through conversation. The idea with a designated building is not to make the owner's life miserable. Like it's not to hold that building you know, perfectly in place. It's to ensure that what is a public value is maintained while still making that building livable. And it's about finding that balance. Hi, Belinda. Bev Mundell-Atherstone, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us today. Look at the crowd in spite of the temperatures. <laughs> okay, I have two questions that kind of arise out of the last things you've been saying. One is in regard to um, <clears throat> historical buildings like the old Alex Arms. Uh, I just loved it that it had the brick, the the red brick and then the white brick. That's so quintessential Canadian to me. And uh, now that it's painted, um, it's lost that character. So my first question is, uh, does the Historical Society do any advocacy for returning uh, buildings to original, original state? And the second question has to do with naming of the alleys. And I'm wondering, is a book forthcoming uh, about that project? Thank you very much. So only buildings that are designated is there any protection on. So just because a building is older, we might think is actually worth 
being designated, if it's not designated, they can do whatever they want with it. And that is, I mean, that's private ownership, right? Um, and so Alec Arms is not a designated building. Um, it is a building that's been around since 1909. It's you know something we all consider a valuable building, but the owners have a perfect right to do whatever because there is no designation. There's none of that uh, balance. And when you get designated, the trade-off trade -off is that you can go for those matching grants and there's you know those sorts of things that are there. And so and just because a building's old doesn't mean anybody can tell the owner what to do with it, right? It's the designation that gives either a bylaw or an act that puts some um, rights onto it. Uh, Advocacy constantly. We're co um, if people want to speak to us, you know, we'll, we'll show them what the building used to look like, give them some, some ideas, work with them, support them in whatever way. It's only advice, um, and we do, that's one of the reasons, again, we do the Facebook posts, we do those sorts of things, um, to quite often remind people of options and what's, you know, what can be done. Um, and, I mean, we, we, you know, trying to do it in a way that it becomes their own idea and they wish to do it, um, but also recognizing that it is the owners who are maintaining those buildings, using those buildings. The other thing that we love to see is change to a building is not necessarily a bad thing. The thing that saves historic buildings more than anything else is adaptive reuse, is when a building has a new lease on life, whether it's, un and it could be a completely different use. I mean, there's a restaurant downtown that used to be a garage. There's all sorts of things. Buildings are not necessarily what they used to be, and that's what saves them. Um, and buildings must have purpose, must have use, and so it is, again, trying to find that balance. Um, and yes, some changes might happen, and we go, yeah. I personally don't like it, but is it keeping the building? Is it still enhancing the downtown and the areas of Lethbridge? Is it still bringing economic well-being to that building in the community? Okay, I can live with those changes. So it's, a, it's always the balance. Second book. In order. Second book. Uh, it may be something that we're looking at. Uh, right now, I am <laughs> having way too much fun with murder. Um, <laughs> historic murder, researching murder. Um, so that's what I've been working on right now is looking at those. So we'll see. It all depends on, on time and everything else. Um, I need to live to 300 to get all my projects done, which is, you know, yeah. I know, I know. Um, every historian leaves a long list of legacy stuff for somebody else to do, but that's the be beauty again of the society, right? My work will live on and I'll just pass it on to another historian in the society. I'll bend. <laughs> Um, but Linda, well, I've noticed lately in thrift stores that there's a lot of old community histories showing up. I think it may be something to do with the fact that the people who bought them back in the 70s or who even worked on them are now dying and that's just something of grandpa's. So it winds up being dispersed. Is anyone archiving this stuff, collecting and archiving this stuff. I certainly don't see it in Lethbridge. And it's not merely things like Leaves of the Medicine Tree out of High River, or you can go, every little community has at least one history, one one history of their community. But also things like the Galt, Music, the Galt Nursing School of Nursing has. Is anyone archiving these? Off the top of my head, I can tell you three sites in Lethbridge where you can find almost complete collections. That would be the Galt Archives, the Lethbridge Public Library, and the Genealogical Society. They all have good libraries of community history books. Um, most of the community history books have also been digitized, so you can also find online sources for all of them. But yeah, I do share the, the concern about um, not people not finding interest, and it probably will happen again that they'll be there. Um, if you see some of them, let me know, because my private collection has a few missing. Um, I have a private collection I know people want to get their hands on. <laughs> um, and so, so a lot of researchers are looking for those. And it is fascinating because they are, they are some of the most valuable sources of local history that we have are those community history books. No place else will you find the lives of just regular average people as much as those family histories. Um, it's also fascinating though what people choose to put in and what they don't. Uh, talking again about some murder research, I know of a murder around Fort McLeod 
Um, and the victim in the family history, they just said he wasn't able to see his gorgeous crop that year because he died. <laughs> well, he was actually murdered, but that's not how the family chose to represent it. So be careful when you read those things too, because they are written by families and we're good at hiding our family secrets. Hi, my name is Knut Peterson. Uh, homelessness is a huge issue these days and arguably a growing one. Uh, I'm just wondering if anything in the past history of Lethbridge that can teach us anything about what to do about homelessness. It's actually funny that you ask that question, not, not that it's not a serious issue, but it's actually on my to-do list of one of the articles I'm writing is on the housing issue of Lethbridge and how it, what we've done. So right now I'm actually looking at the gentle densification that happened in the 1950s when we started to create a lot of the three-story walk-up apartments um, because in the 1950s, 40s and 50s, we had to deal with a great population increase and how we handled that. And there's a story there. If you look back at the history of Alberta, we had rent control brought in by the social credit government. Um, you know that left-wing organization, the social credits, brought in rent control. Um, and so we can look at some of the policies historically across the province. Uh, we also know that we have been dealing with um, people living in tents back you know, early 1900s, there weren't enough houses. We had tents sent up around Lethbridge, and we can look at things of how they dealt with that. Um, one of the things that, you know, again, when we look, and it's an article I've been working on, haven't finished yet, on boarding houses, on how so many houses, especially in Victoria, um, London Road, Westminster, et cetera, those large houses were turned into apartments in the 30s and 40s when there was a housing shortage. And the boarding houses that a lot of women ran, kind of low-key, under the, you know, they had licenses and stuff. Up, but they turned their houses into boarding houses, both to make money, quite often when they were widowed and needed to do that, but also to find housing. And those SROs became illegal in most communities because of health concerns and you know regulations and stuff. But they solved a lot of housing problems. And how to get back to something like an SRO under our new regulations, which is how you know I look at it now when we're doing land use develop land use bylaw development at the city, going, you know. Did, did we have to make some of those things illegal? Was the safety concern big enough? So I, I always take my historian brain when I'm looking at stuff like that. Um, and a lot of, <laughs> when you look at our Facebook posts, a lot of those are kind of trial runs. They're, they're incomplete things that I'm trying to work on. So please, it'd be really silly to take those and use those for a book like somebody did. Um, because they're, they're not complete things, they're, they're issues I'm kind of working on. Um, and that's where I take a lot of those things. So housing, I've got about five different articles I'm working on housing, because we can actually learn a lot. Um, because every issue we deal with has been dealt with in the past. Um, and it's trying to figure out what they did better than what we're doing now, and housing is certainly part of it, um, because there have been boom periods at different times. Um, and yeah, doing apartments well, is something they did better than we do now. Thank you very much, Belinda. Is there any take home message you have for our audience before you leave? Well, since I have you here, I'm gonna make this plea to all of you. You probably all have photographs and documents, you, your family members, etc. Go to an archives or someplace like that and offer them for donation before you ever throw them in the garbage. Because you probably have parts of the Southern Alberta story that are vital that some historian wants to get their hands on, you and others. So please do not just randomly throw things out of your house without talking to an archives or a historian because there are so many buildings and things in Lethbridge that we can't find pictures of that you may actually have that a public archives would love to have and then a historian like me gets to get their hands on.